Hello and welcome. I am Dr. Lara May, a clinical pharmacist specializing in functional medicine, as well as a certified yoga teacher and Reiki master. I run a truly integrative health coaching practice, encompassing functional medicine lab testing, yoga and meditation, and a sprinkling of Reiki energy medicine. Join me here on Light Body Radio to break through your health plateau and come into alignment with your natural vitality. Hello and welcome to another episode of Light Body Radio. I am your host, Dr. Lara May. And today I have with me a special guest, Dr. Melissa McDonald, or Dr. Mac, as she likes to be called. And she is a specialist in uh, sports chiropractic medicine. And she has spent two years of specialty training in human performance. And she focused her research on clinical skills of specific testing and treatment protocols. Additionally, Dr. Mac served as the team clinician for the Minnesota Vixens a professional women's football team, which I think is super cool. And um, they won their conference championships in 2018. Dr. Mack is the chief medical officer for River City Rhythms, a drum corp international marching band, the team chiropractor for uh, Minnesota, is it MN roller derby? Yes, she's shaking her head at me, yes. (laughs) And the team chiropractor for Minnesota Pride. Dr. Mack has achieved both international and national certification as a chiropractic sport provider. She is a speaker on sport chiropractic issues in the United States, as well as abroad. And she is the host of Mac Performance Podcast, a health and wellness podcast that will whiplash you into health, which I love that. Welcome, welcome. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. So tell me about sort of Um, We just went through all your specialty, you know, sports chiropractic achievements. How did you come to be so passionate about this area of chiropractic medicine specifically? So while I was a student, actually, I decided to become an EMT to help get some extra money in. There's a lot of per diem work within that realm. And one of the easiest things to do is work on sidelines. So the first sideline I worked was a senior national games, which is basically Olympics for the 65 and older. And the oldest ath- the oldest athlete competing was like 109. And I got to work tri- triathlon and archery and bowling and golf and just all these different events watching these phenomenal athletes. And if there was a major trauma, like a compound bow exploded and lacerated an arm and tourniquet and all the fun things, Mm -hmm. I was like, I got this. But if there was a minor injury, like a sprain or a strain of an ankle or a shoulder pain, I didn't feel confident in the skills that I had been taught in school to fully diagnose, treat and rehab that. Because Ultimately, chiropractic has been traditionally thought of as a spine specialist, which we are, and our school gears us to that, and we lightly learn the other areas of the body, but I wanted to become a more in-depth, knowledgeable provider, and that's when a sports fellowship opened up at uh, the school I graduated from. Now, residencies and fellowships within chiropractic are not very common. Mm -hmm. The most common one would be a radiology residency. So there are specific diplomated uh, chiropractic radiologists that all they do is read x-rays, read RMRIs, read CTs for chiropractors, because although they read them from the medical perspective, they do add indications, should this person be adjusted or not based on their clinical presentation Mm -hmm. and gives a little chiropractic spin to it. There's also diplomates in pediatrics and geriatrics and internal medicine, and they're just not as common. Probably the two most common are the radiology and the sports. And once I got into that fellowship and I really started looking at understanding rehabilitation, working with my athletes and fully going into the joint by joint of what's going on in the body, it really changed my clinical practice. 
what how so what is an ethical chiropractor and how would one find a specifically ethical chiropractor because there are a wide variety of practitioners out there and even in my own personal realm I am a huge fan of chiropractic adjustments and modalities when it comes to my own health and healing but I've definitely had some really great ones and some not so great ones so um give us a little um you know insight on that so an ethical chiropractor is a term that I've coined when it comes to what do I feel, what is a patient-centered chiropractor when they're really focused on getting you better and getting you out the door faster. And big things that I, the research has found and evidence has supported is that really chiropractic, really great for musculoskeletal conditions so if someone's claiming to treat autism or claiming to be able to work outside the musculoskeletal condition, I get, and only uses chiropractic care, I get really, really concerned. The other thing is, is that for a musculoskeletal condition combined with a home rehab program, it should only take eight to 12 visits to resolve. So if they're selling you 20, 30, 60 visit treatment plans up front, I have major concerns with, is that what's best for your body? Because that's not been supported and needed when it comes to traditional uh, research. And there are some techniques that are like, look, I have the research. And then it's like, look, I have the research that says your research was done badly. So What's going on here, guys? And the other thing that's a big clue to me is x-rays. You do not need an x-ray to see a chiropractor, but it's a really easy way for a chiropractor to scare you into a large treatment plan because most individuals don't know how to read an x-ray and just have to take what is being said as face value. And there are things that we say as providers that become nocebos. Nocebos are the opposite of a placebo, where a placebo makes you feel better, a nocebo makes it worse. And when we're using terms of degenerative disc disease, when we're using terms of twisting of the spine, when we're using big, scary terms that honestly, degenerative disc disease is a sign of normal aging. We're starting to call it the wrinkles of the spine. Just like you get wrinkles on your face, we can't prevent the wrinkles of your spine and it shows you've li- lived an awesome life. That's how we should be discussing degenerative disc disease. And yet people hear that and they're like, oh my God, I'm disabled. I'm gonna end up in a wheelchair, I can't move. And that's when a non-ethical chiropractor goes, but I can help you with this 60 visit plan and I can make sure that it doesn't progress. That isn't patient-centered care. That is chiropractic. That is the doctor centered, covering his paycheck, covering his needs. And yes, chiropractors have to be able to support their families and support themselves, but they need to do it ethically. And that's where I recommend two things to look for within a chiropractor. One, there's a great resource called the Forward Thinking Chiropractic Alliance. They actually have a provider map that has providers across the world that fit the paradigm of short short treatment plans based on your individual needs, because not everybody needs the same thing. And they also all use some form of rehabilitation. Or I use fact, the Factor Provider Network, which Factor is the Functional and Kinetic Treatment and Rehab. I'm sorry, they love their acronyms. And Factor covers more than just chiropractors. It's physical therapists, it's massage therapists, it's athletic trainers. It's everyone within that realm that, again, uses rehab. Rehab, when combined with a chiropractic adjustment, is where we're seeing the best outcomes for our patients. So if they're just adjusting you and not sending you home with work, one, you're becoming reliant on the provider to co- control and manage your issue. When you, you should be able to control your own body and only need to rely on the provider when you do something dumb. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so I, what do you think about the concept of a tune-up? So you've had an injury, you've gone through your short course of treatment and rehab with your fantastic ethical chiropractor. 
And what do you think about the concept of, oh, do I need regular tune-ups or do I really only need to come back when I'm in pain again? So I think that really kind of depends upon what you're doing. Okay. Because when I'm dealing with athletes and specifically my football players, my roller derby skaters, and my drum corps athletes, where they are brutally beating down their body every single day, Mm -hmm. they're going to need, for lack of a better term, tune-ups because Mm -hmm. they're beating their body down. They're taking hits. They're doing things that are causing their body to feel crummy. But for the average individual, if you're working behind a desk, but you're taking the time to get up exercise, drink enough water, get enough sleep, move. For the most part, you're probably going to be able to manage your own body and not have any issues. But if you get into a high stress period where you can't get to the gym as often, you're stressed. So you're starting to maybe eat the crummy foods or rely on some self-soothing mechanisms that aren't necessarily the healthiest options, Mm -hmm. those really, and you're becoming more stagnant, that can lead to issues where you need to be seen. So yes, I do think there are times that you should be seen, but for the average person, do you need to be seen three times a week, every week? No. And that's what I'm seeing a lot of times with our unethical individuals Mm -hmm. is they're doing three times a week, every single week. I have athletes or, well, I call my patient, I call all my patients athletes. So (laughs) whether they are a traditional athlete or if their athletic event is playing ball in the backyard with their kiddos, I call them an athlete and I try to get them in that mindset. So I have some that just come in once a month, they lift, they train, but they have a sedentary job. They do everything right, but things just kind of feel off once a month cool. Mm -hmm. They come in once a month. We go through what's going on. We look at how their bodies moved, changed in the last month. I give them new exercises and then I send them on their way. That's how I kind of see the tune up when there isn't a true injury injury. But then I have other people that I, I have one plays hockey is a firefighter and does CrossFit. It's, it's a dime or dozen each week, which one caused the injury. Oh, for sure. Yeah. That's just an intense lifestyle. I mean, and it's an active lifestyle, which is fantastic, but yeah, I would consider my husband to be in that same boat. He's a skier, professional skier, and he loves to snowmobile and he will push himself even on days where he knows he needs rest. And uh, he works construction. So that's also, you know, very high intensity, just daily life. Uh, So yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the next question, speaking of those, actually, those two specific examples that were both men. So let's take it to the to the female side of things. And do you I'm actually going to stop you. My firefighter is a female. Oh, awesome. That's even better. (laughs) (laughs) That's even better. So being that said, do you see more injuries in females than males? Or is it, um, do you think it's, that's way too simplified? Uh, you know, what do we, and then once we are injured, how do you see our recovery going, uh, in terms of the differences? So I'm going to just start with are injuries more frequent in female athletes, because that's, that's a can of worms unto itself and it's sport to dependent and sports specific, but the bottom answer to that question, kind of the universal thing we are finding across the research is yes. Mm, That's interesting. Uh, Specifically. So when we're looking at comparing NCAA soccer players, so male to female directly, we see a higher frequency of concussions within female athletes. We also see a higher frequency of knee injuries and knee injuries is across the board. Every single sport that a female athlete competes in, except one has a higher incident of ACL injury compared to their male counterpart. And the one is equal is downhill skiing. Mm -hmm. So, and the, and there have been a number of uh, research articles looking into why. 
one of the biggest contributing factor, factors to why female athletes have more injuries is their preseason training and their preseason conditioning, which for female athletes generally consists of running. They're not, they haven't traditionally been taken in the weight room and taught proper squat form, proper deadlift form proper bench. They haven't been heavily loaded and put into heavy, heavy lifting situations. One, because traditionally that's for the boys. Girls don't do that. Oh, but, I'm not infuriating. <laughs> oh, you don't, don't. Or they have this misconception that if they do lift, that they're going to come out looking manly. So they don't want to train as hard. They don't want to go as heavy. Then you also have the issue of reduced energy deficiency in sport, formerly known as the female athlete triad. So in 2014, the name changed to the Red S. And Red S used to be a point of pride for certain athletes. So the female that was the runner, that'd be like, I've ran so hard. I've worked so hard. I've lost my period. I no longer have a menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. And they'd be like, look, I've trained so hard. I've reached there. Oh, great. You've now put yourself at higher risk for stress fractures, for osteoporosis, for depression, for anxiety, for frequent injuries that don't heal. Like, oh, congratulations. Like, yeah. what are you doing? So bizarre. And a coach that's letting you do that as an athlete. Because we didn't understand back in the day what we were actually doing. So it became a point of pride for athletes that have achieved this leanness. And it's like, uh, no bad, bad athlete. It is. Now, other things that have contributed specifically to the knee injuries, they've also looked at hormones. When we look at male athletes, their hormonal hormone cycle daily, female athletes cycle, cycle traditionally, or on average 28 days. The problem is, is we've only ever looked at for a while, how estrogen progesterone affects the boobs and the uterus. We've been thought of as a bikini and not actually look at how those hormones affect every single tissue in our body. Or so how about the adrenals. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Yes. So estrogen specifically softens our ligaments. It gives us more energy. So we're more likely to like push harder through things. And then at ovulation, we actually release the hormone relaxin, which is traditionally only thought of in pregnancy. And it makes our ligaments looser. So this can put you at a higher risk for sustaining some form of knee or ligament tendon injury. Mm -hmm. Then progesterone tightens everything down, but it also lowers your inner um, energy. And then but it increases your ability to develop musculature. It's mind boggling. So what I tell people when I'm working with my female athletes, 90% of what you do with them compared to a male athlete is the same, but there's that 10% tracking, tracking hormones. So specifically what day of what hormone they're on and then playing with their training methods with that. So maybe one week we're doing certain strength and conditioning based on this, but the next week we're working on this and it's all based on their hormone patterning. On top of that, from my perspective, how am I going to do risk injury reduction activities? So mm -hmm. maybe we figure out with certain athletes at certain points in their menstrual cycle, they lose the ability to know where their knee is in space. So they lose proprioception. Well, what can we do to increase proprioception? So those are the type of activities we start to play with to reduce injury risk. Because sadly, there's nothing we can do to prevent it. But my experience, specifically with the Minnesota Vixen, the two seasons that I ran their preseason conditioning while I was in my two-year fellowship, one year we had comprehensive access to weight training, comprehensive access to a gym that I could push them through a movement, loading, uh, plyometric activities, and just comprehensively train them. That season, we had two ACL injuries. Both were prior graft failures. Mm -hmm. Then on a different season, I didn't have access to the weight training. So we did everything else minus the weight training. I had six, six ACLs. Majority wow. of them occurred in preseason. 
like before they even had their first game. And I was furious. So we reviewed tape, did some additional ex- exercises or additional training and activities, looked at what the coaches were doing, made sure they were doing a uh, breakdown training for those who don't know what breakdown training is. It's making sure that you square up prior to changing direction. So you don't expose your knee to excessive mm-hmm. uh, positional <laughs> forces and that helped, but Oh, if I had had the weight room. Yeah. I wonder if we would have had those issues. So that's where from a standpoint, even if you're not an athlete, you might be going, cool. I don't run. I don't do cutting drills. I don't do blah, blah, blah. There's still a benefit to weight training as a female because all our bone density is basically done being created by the time we're 30. And then from then on, we're just losing density. Well, how do bones gain density? load Load, how do we get the best load weight training yes 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 I am this is one of the things I'm passionate and vocal about too and I I did grow up as an athlete I grew up as a swimmer and I was an NCAA double a NCAA athlete um for my first year in college until the balance between the academics and the sports got to be too much but Yeah, it's amazing to me. I feel like I was lucky and that later on in high school, I was exposed to the weight room, which I do feel lucky about. And then it continued within the NCAA realm. But you're right there. There is a lot of like, okay, females train this way, males train this way. And there is a difference like we just talked about. But I think also too, like I feel and it's evolving and that's great. But coaches I think really need to take more responsibility for their athletes. And, you know, they, you know, it's being an athlete tunes you into your body just by nature of what you're doing. But if we could take that a step further and, you know, and even if, you know, male coaches are uncomfortable, they could pull in, you know, even an assistant coach that's a female or enlist a chiropractor that is in tune with these and, and really have those female athletes tune into their cycles and that little bit of education and awareness could go so far, not only within the athletic realm, but then further on in life too, maybe, you know, obviously like when you're out of college, but it's really important for women to still be in tune with the cycles. Are they having them? Are they not, you know, maybe they're not later on in life because they're on hormone replacement therapy which can be both good and bad, depending on how you're approaching it and what you're doing with it. So yeah, I love that. And for sure, especially later on in life, I don't think there's a time when a woman shouldn't be weightlifting and it doesn't have to be crazy balls to the wall. It doesn't have to be CrossFit, you know, cause there, I love CrossFit, but I do feel like, again, there's extremes, <laughs> you know? And so I, there's, I think that there's just so much more education we can do as whether or not we're the practitioner that's also an athlete and, or we're just trying to prevent osteoporosis in our female patients and, um, and clients. Oh, I mean, you bring up a huge gap in the resources to our female athletes, which is there are very few female coaches. True. Yes. Yes. I never had a female swimming coach ever. No, that's not true. I did in my club. So I, I swam club also, um, growing up and I had one female coach in that club environment, but all my academic coaches were male. Mm -hmm. And that that's a huge gap in what is accessible. So I'm, I'm happy to see that there are even shifts within male sports that are starting to have female athletes. Like the number of female coaches this year in the Super Bowl and the actually having a female referee, like, oh my God, look, you can do it. Yeah, amazing. (laughs) Majority of the female coaches that are coming into the NFL are from the WFA, the Women's Football Alliance, which is the league the Vixen play in. The uh, coach Lowe, which is the assistant defensive coordinator for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, is on the advisory board for the WFA. Awesome. These, these are women that are coming off the field 
and are coming with their experiences. And I, I think this is the thing. Like people are like, oh my gosh, there's female full pad football, not the lingerie league that exists. Yeah. Um, not only ha- does it exist, it's been around. The Minnesota Vixen are the longest running. They are original foundation team and they've never not had a season minus the pandemic. Mm. And this is their 23rd year. 23 years it's existed and you've never heard of it. That's so frustrating. There are over 60 teams across the country that play and compete. There is a U.S. national team for football that competes in the world games because it's a world game sport where people from across the world play. Like this is so much bigger than we realize. Yeah. Yeah. We need to, you know, to think about that, that marketing. <laughs> oh, so whenever I can, I bring it up. But when it comes to lifting, like I'm probably one of the more psycho lifters. I'm not a CrossFit athlete, but I am currently training to get to a thousand pounds. Wow. And what, cool. <laughs> so I'm trying to get my deadlift, my bench and my squat to add together to a thousand pounds. Uh, my current PR is at about 630. So I'm, I'm, I'm close. But that's still 300 pounds to add on somewhere <laughs> Yeah, is a doozy of a task. But that's what I'm working for because, yes, I am over the age of 30. Yes, I'm not adding any more bone to my bones mm-hmm. per the research. But I, also by loading, my bones are going, oh, crap. We still – we can't – go away. Go away, osteophytes. I want to keep our bone density because this psychopath is putting too much weight on us. So it's helping prevent the loss. So yes, weight training throughout your life is huge and beneficial. And there are some phenomenal bodybuilders. I'm thinking of this one. She looks incredible. She's like 70 and still does physique competitions. Mm -hmm. And she looks amazing. And all she does is weight train. She doesn't have that kyphotic spine where she's all hunched over. She doesn't look like a 70 year old. Honestly, she looks like she's 40 and she's cut, ripped and gorgeous. Like weight training is your key to long life, long, healthy movement-based life. Yes. I can't even tell you, especially as of late, I've, you know, um, I'm 40, about to be 41. I work with a lot of female uh, clients and patients that are, I would consider them contemporary of my age, uh, you know, give or take five to 10 years. I can't tell you how many women I have come to me. Well, what, what else can I do to lose weight? Okay. Uh, What are you doing for your movement practice? Well, I don't want to run. That's fine. You don't have to run. There's so many other things, but are you weight training? Ew, I don't want to look like a man. Oh my God, you're not going to look like a man, but you know what? You need muscle mass. Muscle burns more calories than fat does. And you need it to prevent bone loss because I think a lot, I think there's this huge information and education gap too, just about how our bones regenerate and grow and break down. And it is a cycle. And I, I, you know, like we talk about the cyclical growth and breakdown of so many cells in different parts of our body, but I don't really think that there's that much conversation about bone growth and breakdown. And so that's something that I talk a lot with my clients too. Um, You want to give us the, the chiropractor's bird's eye view on that? Uh, I mean, from the chiropractic bird's eye view, this is, I I look at it more from the sports view, which is simple lift weights, you'll be healthier. If you want to do cardio, lift weights faster. (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) I I am the antithesis of the anti-runner. I'm, I hate running. I, I actually grew up as a competitive swimmer as well. Uh, but then we moved to Michigan away from all the pools and I stopped competitively swimming. Otherwise I probably would have gone on to college as a swimmer and It's one of those things like, yes, swimming is super healthy because it's non-weight bearing, but it's also detrimental because it's not weight bearing. Mm -hmm. So you have to have some form of load. And if you hate running, you hate doing cardio. Oh my God. The elliptical is the bane of your existence. Cool. You don't need it. Go into the gym and lift weight. And if you're not comfortable, almost every single gym you have has trainers get with a trainer, have them work with you, give you a basic understanding of what you need and understand 
a lot of it comes down to mental blocks when it comes to the amount of weight you're lifting. Yes. We, and, and you need heavy load and you're not going to come out looking like this crazy ripped Arnold type of person. One, you're only going to get there if you're training eight hours a day, consuming hundreds of grams of protein right? Yeah. and probably being on injectable testosterone. Cause without the testosterone, you're not going to build the muscle the way a male athlete does. And in fact, a lot of the male athletes still have to use testosterone to reach those massive, massive sizes. Mm -hmm. So what you're going to do is actually tone and that muscle gets hungry and it's going to gnaw through that fat. And it's actually what is going to help you slim and lean down. But muscle does way more than fat. So we just need to step away from the scale. How, what a scale tells you can be so <laughs> defeating and so frustrating, and you just need to ignore it and go off how you look, how you feel, how your clothes fit. Yes. Because yes, you can, I am a sturdy gal, as my husband puts it. I am dense. And when people look at me, they usually guess that I weigh about 170 pounds, but I'm, I'm five, eight. So I'm, I'm fairly tall. Let me tell you, I don't weigh that much. I weigh a lot more because I am densely packed muscle because I'm moving so much weight. And so when I get on the scale, I'm like, Oh my God, this oh, is yeah. awful. Oh yeah. One of my clients and was like, I hate this number on the scale. I'm like, well then stop weighing yourself. <laughs> That's facts. a very simple solution. And she looked at me and rolled her eyes by like, no, really? Because, and I repeated to her exactly what you just said, how you feel, you know, how your clothes fit, all those things. Yes. So yeah, oh, it's, so. it's so frustrating because we get so caught up in what social media, the Instagram blogger, the, I mean, if anything, it's gotten so much worse. All these perfectly posed pictures. I'm sorry. I can take a picture on the same day and I can look 50 pounds lighter simply by how I contort and twist my body versus taking on a front on picture. They're all posed, lighted, and mysteriously edited to make themselves look a certain way. Do not believe what you're seeing in photos. You have to go off what you're feeling and how you're moving. And if you're feeling fatigued and crummy and not being able to do the movements you want, then you need to change your activity and work with someone who's educated, whether that be a coach, a trainer, a chiropractor, a physiotherapist, someone that is advocating for you in your movement to get you to the level you want to be at. Yes. Yes. I feel like one of the first, one of the worst offenders is the Western medicine BMI. <gasps> and with you just going into the direction of your muscle mass and what people would think that you weigh versus what you actually weigh, I can, I totally relate again, being a lifelong female athlete, thank God I have more muscle mass than the average female. But also when I go to the doctor, the, one of the first things they want to tell me is maybe you should think about losing weight. Oh. I'm sorry. My gene size is between a four to a six. And just because I weigh like 160 pounds, <laughs> I'm only five, four. <laughs> so my BMI is skewed, but I have a fair amount of muscle mass. And yeah, I mean, there's, I could probably lose a little bit more body percentage of fat, but, um, you know, I mean, would like, it be healthy? Would exactly. it be healthy for you to lose that body exactly. fat because you need the fat for hormones and to feed your, sorry. Um, mm, no, no. Yeah. yeah. Go. You're, pre -pre you're go oh, <laughs> here we go. Buckle up listeners. <laughs> BMI is garbage. It Thank was you. never to be designed to be utilized on humans. It was a mathematician creating a theoretical system to calculate body mass, but it was never actually to be implemented on humans because there are such extremes within human performance. So most athletes that have like two to three body fat percentage that are sheer down. So when you see like those physique athletes, their BMI puts them in an obese category too, because they're so dense, but if they lost any weight, they would die. Like my BMI puts me at an obese category one. I think my BMI is like 32 
oh, oh, the horror. Yeah, right. Okay, cool. I don't have blood pressure issues. I don't have cholesterol issues. I don't have diabetes. I don't have any of the things. And oh, you see that deadlift bar that's 250 pounds? I'm going to pick it up and throw it at you. Like <laughs> you have to take into account what you're doing. And yes, the health insurance health insurance companies have latched onto the BMI to determine what your risk is for your future expenses. Meaning it wasn't even based off a of medical choice. It was based off of money. Mm -hmm. BMI should make you ragingly mad because it's going to determine your premiums. Mm -hmm. So if you have a higher BMI, whether you are or aren't healthy, they're going to rack your premiums up because you've been determined high risk. BNMI is garbage. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Right. No, don't apologize. <laughs> These are the important conversations that need to be had more. And especially, you know, you and I are both trained in a Western medicine, quote unquote, model of uh, me as a pharmacist, you as a chiropractor. But I think it's so imperative that as we grow as practitioners, that we also bring that knowledge to the forefront and to our patients and our clients and to our other healthcare practitioners, because it is important information and school is important, but it shouldn't be considered gospel. No school. I love, I loved going to school. I'm actually now an adjunct faculty member at the school I graduated from. And here's what, here's the problem with healthcare that I think patients don't fully understand or the general population doesn't understand. And that is we're continually doing research. We are looking into and trying to find best practices. And a lot of times what we were doing 10 years ago has been proven to not be the best practice that we're practicing now. And that's so uncomfortable for patients to realize, oh, what I had done 10 years ago, you're no longer doing. So was it wrong? Well, if you had it done today, yes, it would be wrong. What they did back then is was the best information they had. Medicine is always evolving. And I think one of the areas that has the most, there are two areas that I find have the most confusion on them. One, concussion science and research. Holy crap. We have put a lot of resources into understanding that little booger. And the problem is, is we still don't have a gold standard of diagnosis, meaning you, we cannot diagnose from an MRI, a CT, we're basing it off of symptoms still and having to rule out, rule out the other big, scary things. And the other thing is, is like, so when I was in high school, you weren't immediately play, pulled from play from being hit. You were told you weren't allowed to sleep and you were returned to school the next day. Now we pull you if we even kind of think you hit your head. You were told to immediately sleep as much as possible because that's how your brain heals. And then we put you on a return to play, return to learn, return to work, whatever best applies to you to get you back to the activities you want. And now we're actually starting to introduce activity almost on day one of recovery, because we're finding that getting you back to some form of movement, whether that's simply riding a bike, going for a walk, helps you heal faster as long as we look at your symptoms and your symptoms aren't getting worse. Now, the other one that's hugely confusing is what we're now calling tendinopathies, formerly known as tendinitis. We've done oodles of research that show that it's not actually an inflammatory process affecting the tendons, which is why we need to call them tendinopathies. And tendinopathies respond to movement and weight bearing. So resting and icing make it worse. But if, you, if you're so stuck in calling it a tendinitis, which Dr. Google was what you're going to get, when someone tells you to move and load, you're going to be like, whoa, that's going to make it worse. But no, it's all about optimally loading the injury appropriately under supervision that gets you better faster and gets you back to your activities. Like we're learning so much and it's turning over so fast that as a general population provider, it's impossible to keep up with. And even in the medical realm, unless you dedicate time to it each week, you're behind and you're making bad recommendations. 
Yeah, I think, you know, I think that's why specialists are so important, but also that we come together and we talk about these things. And, and so uh, as a consumer and as a patient and as a, um, a, a person that is looking for that provider, I would encourage all of you out there. And even if you're a healthcare provider looking for another provider to help you along your healing path, find someone that you resonate with and that you do see improvement with. If you don't, or if, yeah, if you're not feeling better and if you're not seeing the change that you want, then, you know, ask questions, be involved, be an advocate, but don't be afraid to, to move on. <laughs> and, and I will say that one, there is one issue within chiropractic is that anybody can call themselves a sports chiropractor without having had to go through the training or certification process. Mm. So if you want to work with a true sports chiropractor, you need to see some letters after the name. Yeah. Mainly ICSE. This is your international sports certified chiropractor or internationally certified sports chiropractor. There it is. CCSP certified chiropractic sports practitioner or your DACBSP, the diplomate in the American. Oh, what is it? DACB diplomate American chiropractic board of sports practitioners. That's the next one I'm gunning for right now, mm -hmm. but COVID has delayed me because we can't have in-person testing. And that requires a six hour in-person assessment. So those are the three certificates that are going to give you a good indication whether someone is or isn't a sports provider. Then some extras, C CSCS, certified strength and conditioning a specialist factor F A K T R. Those are also going to be good indicators. If they have those letters, if you have someone that just is a DC and they're claiming to do sports, I would ask what's their training. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be afraid to like do some digging. You know, if they have a website, great, go on there, see where they were educated. What extra certificates have they done? What is their continuing education? Hopefully they have some of that posted on. Because in general, I think as practitioners, we do gravitate towards some sort of specialty. I mean, there are the, the generalists, the, you know, um, the intensivists, the, the in, in my realm, the hospitalists, those that are, you know, internal medicine specialists, which we would consider generalists now, even though that's still a specialty. <laughs> so, but in general, you should be able to find something that is in alignment with, with what you're looking for specifically. Exactly. It's, that's one thing that I really like is our specialty training is our ability to have that focal group. So yes, I treat everyone, but my primary focus is athletes. And a lot of times people who are active gravitate toward me simply because I have all the sports content on my website and I've gone against some traditional marketing norms, marketing norms, health and wellness care is green and blue coloring. My coloring for my website is red, red and gray. Like it is. And when you see red and gray, you think performance and sport. And I want that to be your first thought when you see me, that doesn't mean I am not going to take care of everyone. It is going to mean that if you come into me, and you're a beer league hockey player, I'm going to focus in on making sure you can stay on the ice with whatever activity you want. And in Minnesota, I get a lot of beer league hockey players. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So what else? We're coming to the end of our time. Have we not talked about something that you really want to bring light and attention to? Oh, no, I don't think so. We've covered like all my favorite things to talk about like finding the right chiropractor. Cause I just, there are so many chiropractors out there. There are, there's almost one on every corner at this point in time. They're just everywhere. The issue is, is not all of them has taken the time to be mm -hmm. patient centered and patient advocating. And I just want people to know how to spot who's going to take care of their family best, who's going to do what is best for them. And then from the female perspective, getting into the gym, it can be intimidating because a lot of times when you go into the weight section, there are only males there. And frankly, males in the gym are horrifically rude and awful, which, oh man, 
my favorite thing is to make sure that any of the males around me, I'm lifting heavier than them. <laughs> that brings me a lot of joy, but it, it's one of those things that can be very intimidating and the best way to get over it, find a friend and go lift with them. Find someone that is able to support you. You both can go into that area together and you guys can stand up for each other and get the work done. And ask for help. There are some phenomenal female personal trainers out there, whether you do it digitally online or meet with them in person that can help you learn the skills to be a successful weightlifter and be able to move the weights to keep yourself healthy so that you feel supported. Yes, absolutely. And I think uh, in, in conjunction with that is building your, your own healthcare team around you. So being that like a health, uh, um, sorry, a chiropractor, a, you know, a trainer or female friend that has experience with the correct form and way to progress through the weightlifting, um, you know, uh, maybe a health coach or functional medicine practitioner or some sort of, um, you know, acupuncture or something like that so that you're getting the full, full circle of full support. I completely agree. A lot of us are fine assembling a team for our finances. So we have our financial advisor, we have our accountant, we have our baking specialist, we have our people managing our money. There's no reason why we can't have a management team to control our health. And honestly, at this point in time, that's what we need. So yes, you need your team and they all need to be on the same page and willing to communicate which is why when I'm working with patients, I have a list of providers. I'm comfortable sending them in my area because I know I can call them up and we can chit chat so that I fully know what they're doing to you. And I'm not relying on you to communicate it because bless your hearts, you always miss something really important or you take something really wrong. But I can communicate with them to fully have a full picture of what's going on with your health to help kind of steer and guide and make sure my care is also complementing what you need. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I don't really, uh, my new view on this is that I don't really see a lot of competition. I just see opportunity to build, build bridges, help our communities and the public just be healthier. And yes. yeah, we're not going to get there unless we all work together for the benefit of our patients. Exactly. There is no one provider that can do it all. Oh, and if they're, not. Yeah. if they're claiming to do it all, that should be a big red flag that they're more concerned with themselves than for you as a patient yeah. or client or yeah. athlete. Yeah. And there's still a role for that, that classic, you know, PCP, MD, you know, there's absolutely that role there, but they shouldn't be the end all and be all to your healthcare. So I just want to put that out there that I still love you, Western Medicine MDs. I have one myself that I love dearly (laughs) and I appreciate, but I definitely have a team of different providers that I rely on and I encourage my, my patients and my clients to do the same. Oh, I completely agree. One of the, I love my MDs. They are phenomenal when you are sick. They are phenomenal at taking care of those uh, chronic high blood pressure, diabetic issues. The issue is, is their training is not necessarily geared towards musculoskeletal conditions. They're geared towards referring for those. So that's where you need your musculoskeletal, your body care team. That's your chiropractors. That's your physios. That's your massage therapists. That's your acupuncturists. You, they need a team as well. So understanding. I love my, I love my MD. I love what Western medicine has provided and prevented and allowed us to get as a direction and population. But when it comes to low back pain, bless their hearts. (laughs) Yes. And on that note, we will close it up. Thank you so much. Uh, Tell us where we can find you and, and all the fun stuff. Absolutely. So as mentioned in the beginning, I am the host of the Mac Performance Podcast, the podcast that will whiplash you into health as we jump from different health and wellness topics. I also have an Instagram at MacP underscore clinic. And my clinic, if you're in the Twin Cities area and want to come see me, is Mobility Agility Chiropractic Performance. That's right. It's Mac Performance where you can see Dr. Mac. 
Awesome. Cool. Well, maybe um, we'll have you back sometime soon and we'll talk about that low back pain. <laughs> oh, that's a can of worms. That is, is a can right? of a worms. Whole another hour <laughs> <laughs> at minimum, I would assume. So <laughs> again, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to having you back. Oh, thank you. It was wonderful to be here.